present in the banquet of the Kimmage. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. We can begin? Is that a show? Recording in progress. Yes, we can begin, Maharaj. Om Magyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militani Natasman Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha kaupata rubyas cha kripa sindhu bai he bacha patita nam pavane bio vaishnavi bio namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shri vasadi gor bhaktavanda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama 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 Hari Hari. So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 3 and we're, we were hearing about the appearance of Lord Varaha in Lesson 1. Was everyone able to see the PowerPoint? Yes Maharaj. Yes Maharaj. Okay good. I think Marge, you pressed you pressed paste instead of start presentation. Oh, so really? I think you have to undo. <laughs> no, I have to go go back and log in again then. No, no, no. I just at the top it says undo. Oh, really? Yeah, it's like. Um, <laughs> Where? Uh, there's like a shortcut. Uh, I think if you just present again. Yeah. We can just quickly help you. Then what? Uh, I think, you know, next to where the save button is, there's like a back button at the top, the quick actions right at the top. Oh. Yeah, just slightly higher, 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 yeah, uh, higher. yeah, that one, that one, that one, yes. Undo paste, yeah. Oh, really? Yes, Marge. There we go. Well, thank you very much, Prabhu. <laughs> I, I really don't know much about computers, I'm afraid. I'm too old for these things. All right, so what do I need to press now? I need to go into... I think you can click play from current slide or play from start. Yeah, either one should. Yeah, okay. All right, Unit 9, Varaha Avatar, Lesson 2. Lesson 1, Revision. Everyone remembers what we covered? The overview of Unit 9, Varaha Leela. Chapters 13 and 17 to 19. We identify principles regarding the father and son relationships from the example of Brahma and the Kumaras. I think you'll remember that. That was quite an interesting exercise. And I think some of you uh, had an awakening about that the principles in relation to current social issues in ISKCON. Certainly very important, current social issues in ISKCON. Uh, we're very cautious about uh, trying to indoctrinate people too quickly into Krishna consciousness. We have to be careful, move with caution. <laughs> So father and son, guru and disciple relationships, they're very sensitive. Nowadays, if the, if, the, if the son doesn't like the father, he can call the police and say, my father's beating me, and the police will come and arrest the father. So even father and son relationships are not what they used to be. All right, then other points we spoke about, the demonic qualities of Haranyaksha. 
as a demon, he's a good example. His enthusiasm for finding gold, drilling up the earth, so much so that the earth fell out of orbit and fell into the bottom of the universe. And he was always eager to fight. He was challenging everyone for fight. And then the relationship between natural disturbances and an increase of demonic population. Natural disturbances. We wonder what is natural anymore? Is, is this pandemic, is it a natural disturbance? Is COVID a natural disturbance or is it not? Anyway, there's, there's always the increase of demonic population. And the, the natural disturbances do reflect that increase in demonic population. Natural disturbances, earthquakes, tsunamis, plagues, pesticides, all these things. All right? Any, are there any questions on those points which we covered in the last class? Anybody has any problems with these things? Are the ladies happy? Are you understand these principles about father and son relationships? Mother and son must be different, right? Father's different from the mother. So no questions? Okay, we'll go ahead. Chapter 14. Pregnancy of Diti in the evening. So the first section of the chapter deals with Vidura asking Maitreya what was the reason for the fight between the demon king and Lord Bor. Maitreya then narrates how Diti begged her husband Kashyapa to have intercourse with her in the evening. Kashyapa requests Diti to wait because the time was inauspicious. Okay, let's have a look at this chap the beginning of this chapter. If you look to the first verse, it begins with Sukadeva Goswami. I'll just read the first verse. After hearing from the great sage Maitreya about the Lord's incarnation as Varaha, Vidura, who had taken a vow, begged, begged him with folded hands to please narrate further transcendental activities of the Lord, since he, Vidura, did not yet feel satisfied. So it's a very nice relationship there, Maitreya and Vidura. Vidura is very eager to hear. And then Vidura says, O chief among the great sages, I have heard by disciplic succession that Haranyaksha, the original demon, was slain by the same form of sacrifices, the personality of Godhead, Lord Bor. And there in the purport, Prabhupada talks about the two different incarnations of Lord Varaha, one in the Swayambhuva uh, millennium and the other in the Chakshusha millennium. And one Swayambhuva millennium was the white boar and Chakshusha millennium was the red colored boar. So the Swayambhuva millennium, the Lord in the form of Varaha picks up the earth from the bottom of the universe and in the Chakshusha millennium he kills Saranyaksha. So then Vidura asks, what was the reason, O Brahmana, for the fight between the demon king and Lord Bor while the Lord was lifting the earth as his pastime? Yeah. Why, Vidura is puzzled, why, why would somebody object to the Lord lifting the earth from the bottom of the universe? Why fight with someone? 
Is it? He's doing good. It's 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 a great. Why challenge the Lord? But this was Haranyaksha's demonic nature. So this is Vidura's question. And Vidura said, My mind has become very inquisitive. Therefore, I am not satisfied hearing the narration of the Lord's appearance. Please, therefore, speak more and more to a devotee who is faithful. And Maitreya replies, Your inquiry made by you is just befitting a devotee because it concerns the incarnations of the Personality of Godhead. He is the source of liberation from the chain of birth and death for all those who are otherwise destined to die. So this is very nice description. He glorifies Vidura. He calls him a warrior. Oh, warrior! Of course, he's from the Kurus, so they're a family of warriors. But also, he's a warrior for another reason. Right? Does anyone know? Why is he addressed as a warrior? Yes? Because he was capable of conquering the material nature, the Maya, because he was Krishna conscious, a devotee of Lord Krishna. So, why is he a warrior? What's he doing? He is, uh, he is capable of fighting against the material world, the Maya. Fighting against the material world, yes. He's fighting against the world of birth and death, right? He wants to overcome the laws of the material world, birth and death. He wants to get out of that place. He'd like to overcome that situation. So that's the idea. Why stay in this world of birth and death? But you have to fight. You have to be willing to conquer birth and death. Maharaj Dasarat said to Vishwamitra, Oh, great soul who is engaged in conquering over death. All right, so uh, Maitreya continues, text number six. By hearing these topics from the sage Narad, the son of King Uttanapada, Dhruva, was enlightened regarding the personality of Godhead, and he ascended to the abode of the Lord, placing his feet over the head of death. So this is a nice example given about how the devotee conquers over death. Dhruva Maharaj had no fear of death. He'd already uh, seen the Lord. He'd gone off into the forest when he was a little boy and he got success. Then he came back to the world. He became king. He ruled the world. He had a family. He had children. And then he gave it all up. At an early age, he gave up everything and went off to perfect his life, to conquer over death. So that, that is Dhruva Maharaj, a nice example. We should feel encouraged hearing about Dhruva and his activities. Yeah, yes, Prabhu. Uh, can I ask a question to Maharaj? Please yeah. do. Yes, uh, Maharaj, uh, in the two different millenniums, uh, uh, both appear, Shayambhu and uh, Chakyusha, but what uh, is to my understanding that these two incidents took place uh, in, in a single incident, that is, uh, means one after another. Is it true? Well, uh, it was pointed out that uh, it appears like the, the two inc incidents were amalgamated. They were brought together for the sake of the writing of the Bhagavatam. It appears like Vyasadeva combined the two incidents here. 
because it is pointed out that there are two incarnations of Lord Bohr and that one Lord Bohr is picking up the universe, picking up the earth rather, and the other Lord Bohr is killing, and the other colour of Lord Bohr in the different millennium is killing Haranyaksha. So it appears like they're separate incidents, but for the sake of narrating them, my Vyasadeva just combined them together, brought the two incidents together. And that's it's and that would relate to the question. Because in this in this purport here which we're quoting why why did uh, why did the demon fight with Lord Bohr when he's picking up the universe? So it appears like they're fighting to, at one time, right? But we are told that there's two separate boars. One's white colour, one's a red colour. And they're different millenniums. Anyway. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. We try to understand these things. It's not always so easy. Okay, going ahead. Uh, Coming up to text 17 to 29, we will hear about uh, Kashyapa. Kashyapa, the husband. <coughs> he has many wives, right? How many wives does he have? Seven. Thirteen. Thirteen wives. How many? Thirteen. Thirteen. One tree. One tree, okay. And we're hearing about DT. Who who were the wives? Who were these women? They, who, they were all daughters of? Daksha. Yes, right. The daughters of Daksha. So, this chapter is concerning DT and her husband Kashyapa. But before, before we discuss that further, uh, just to read a little more, the other verses, text 7. This history of the fight between the Lord as a boar and the demon Haranyaksha was heard by me in a year long ago, as it was described by the foremost of the demigods, Brahma, when he was questioned by the other demigods. So even the demigods here discussing the activities of the Lord. Then text 8 begins with description about Diti, daughter of Daksha, being attracted by sex desire, begged her husband in the evening in order to beget a child. The sun was setting and the sage was sitting in trance after offering oblations to the Supreme Lord Vishnu. And then... Text 10, in that place, the beautiful deity expressed her desire. O oh, learned one, Cupid is taking his arrows and distressing me forcibly as a mad elephant troubles a banana tree. And so a banana tree doesn't have much chance in the presence of a mad elephant. The elephant will soon knock over banana trees. They're easy. So in the same way, Diti is really disturbed by her passionate desires. So she pleads with her husband. Text, ther text 11 said, Therefore, you should be kind towards me by showing me complete mercy. I desire to have sons, and I am much distressed by seeing the opulence of my co-wives. By performing this act, you will become happy. So, what was the opulence of the co-wives? Now, 
have a child. So you can understand the situation. You know, one wife has something, the other wife doesn't. It's a problem. Even Lord Krishna was aware of that. Remember the, the Parijata flower given to Rukmini by Narada? And who got, who got envious? Satyabhama, right. So Lord Krishna had to take her with him up to heaven and get her a par get her parijata tree. So you have to you have to deal with people fairly. Yes, you give one wife, you have to give the other special it's it's not such an easy thing. It's to keep them all happy. So she's pleading mercy. Now, of course, it's the principle of householder life. When the wife approaches the husband like that, for the we saw, uh, we'll see later on in the third canto. You'll see the example, Kardama Muni and Devahuti. Devahuti begs him; she also wants to have a child. So Kardama had to arrange his ability. Okay, text number 12. Text number 12. A woman is honoured in this world by the benediction of her husband. And a husband like you will become famous by having children because you are meant for the expansion of living entities. So, how do you understand this? What is the duty of Kashyapa? Give a child. What kind? But only, only, what kind? Only children? What? No, to satisfy wife, whatever she wants. All right, to satisfy the wife. Yeah, that's one that will say. But he, he has also a responsibility in the universe, right? He has, he has, he's supposed to beget good children for the purpose of liberation. He's, all, he's, he's actually like a Prajapati. And that so many different living entities are going to take birth from the wombs of different wives. Not only humans, but different animals, different creatures all come due to him. And it's different wives. So Diti continues, In days long ago, our father, the most opulent Daksha, who was affectionate to his daughters, asked each of us separately whom we would prefer to select as our husband. So, they were allowed to choose their husband. They told the, the, the father, asked them who they would like to have a husband. They had their choice. Of course, the father could also decide, but he asked his daughters who they had in mind. And then Diti says, Our well-wishing father, Daksha, after knowing our intentions, handed over thirteen of his daughters unto you. And since then, we have all been faithful. So very nice situation. Thirteen sisters all together with the same husband. And we hope they're able to get along with each other. They've all been faithful to the husband, so that's, that's nice. Anyways, Daksha arranged for the marriage of his daughters. And Prabhupada's purport, Prabhupada writes, 
Every one of Diti's sisters was a mother of children. Therefore, since she was equally faithful to the same husband, why should she remain without children? O Lotus-Eyed One, kindly bless me by fulfilling my desire. When someone in distress approaches a great person, his plea should never go in vain. So that's the idea. Diti knew that her request might be rejected because of the untimely situation. Untimely meaning it's, an, it's the evening, it's an inauspicious time, it's not the proper time for conceiving a child. But she pleaded that when there is an emergency or a distressful situation, there is no consideration of time or situation. <laughs> so she has her arguments. Although Kashyap is telling her, this is not an auspicious time, she's saying, no, it's an emergency. I'm in distress. It's a distressing condition. So it doesn't matter about the time or situation. This is her reasoning. She did have, she did have some arguments. O hero Vidura, Diti being thus afflicted by the contamination of lust, and therefore poor and talkative, was pacified by the son of Marici in suitable words. Prabhupada writes in the purport, text 16, When a man or woman is afflicted by the lust of sex desire, it is to be understood as sinful contamination. This is a good sentence to remember when we are influenced by the lust of sex desire, this is due to sinful contamination. Kashyapa was engaged in his spiritual activities, but he did not have sufficient strength to refuse his wife, who was thus afflicted. He could have refused her with strong words expressing impossibility, but he was not as spiritually strong as Vidura. Vidura is addressed here as a hero because no one is stronger in self-control than a devotee of the Lord. It appears that Kashyapa was already inclined to have sexual enjoyment with his wife. And because he was not, because he was not a strong man, of course he he, he tried to dissuade her with pacifying words. He was not a strong man. We're not talking about physical strength. We're talking about his mental strength. His control of his mind and senses was not very strong. So he tried to discourage her by speaking pacifying words. But what he should have done, Prabhupada seems to indicate, he should have spoken strongly. He should have chastised her, rebuked her. Stupid woman, get away from here. You know, you know, he should have spoken a little harshly to her, to bring her to her senses, to get her out of her illusion, out of her lust. But he was weak. He didn't do it. So, text 17 continues, O afflicted one, Kashyapa is speaking to Diti, I shall forthwith gratify whatever desire is dear to you, for who else but you is the source of the three perfections of liberation. <laughs> So you can see Kashyapa uh, glorifying his wife. The three perfections being Dharma, Artha and Kama. So the Prabhupada explains, for a conditioned soul 
the wife is considered the source of liberation because she offers her service to the husband for his ultimate liberation. So having a, a faithful wife is certainly a great benefit for a, a man. Conditional material existence is based on sense gratification. And if someone has the good fortune to get a good wife, he is helped by the wife in all respects. If one, is, if one is disturbed in his conditional life, he becomes more and more entangled in material contamination. A faithful wife is supposed to cooperate with her husband in fulfilling all material desires so that he can then become comfortable and execute spiritual activities for the perfection of life. If, however, the husband is progressive in spiritual advancement, the wife undoubtedly shares in his activities. All right? The husband and wife, they share each other's pious Activities. If the husband does some pious activity, then the wife will get half of the benefit. And if the husband does something sinful, the wife will also have to take some of the, the, the sinful reactions. They share the karma. So that's the way of household or life, family life. They have to help each other. So the, the husband must be engaged in spiritual advancement. And then the wife will share in the benefit in his activities. Both husband and wife profit in spiritual perfection. If the husband goes back to Godhead, the wife will follow her husband. She will go with her husband back to Godhead. So Prabhupada said, it is essential therefore that girls, as well as boys, be trained to discharge spiritual duties, so that at the time of cooperation, both will be benefited. The training of the boy is brahmacharya, and the training of the girl is chastity. A faithful wife and a spiritually trained brahmachari are a good combination for advancement of the human mission. Yes, someone who's trained as a good brahmachari, they can make a good husband. They'll be successful in family life. In fact, if someone is not trained in brahmachari life, it will be very difficult for him to be a happy man in family life. If the man is simply a womanizer who lusts after women, he, then he'll never be happy with one wife. He'll always be looking at other women and chasing other women. He won't be a faithful husband. And that's also true of the wife. The wife has to be, the woman has to be trained in chastity. And when she's married, she has to accept her husband and be faithful to him. That is the principle. All right, so Kashyapa pacifies his wife, glorifying her and wives in general for the invaluable service. It's text 17 to 21. At the same time, he warns his wife not to underestimate the importance of Lord Shiva. We no, miss. Maharaj, sorry, Maharaj. I, I, have, I have two questions in this aspect. Okay. Yeah, if a husband uh, renders a devotional practices and wife doesn't, so shall he be with the husband to the spiritual world? No, if the husband renders devotional practices, then but the wife doesn't. Oh, yeah, the, hus the wife will sh still share the benefit from the husband. 
Okay, so she is entitled to the spiritual world? Yes, she can go on the strength of a, the devotional activities of the husband, she'll be greatly benefited. Yeah? Okay, my second question. Is it true that 50% of the devotional uh, piety is uh, shared with the wife of the husband? What's that? 50% of the devotional piety means devotional savings uh -huh. will directly go to the wife? Yes, that's what they say. Yeah, the wife and the husband, they share each other's karma. Now, if the wife is not doing any devotional activity, then of course it's not going to be much good for the husband. The husband should, he should encourage the wife also in devotional life. Okay, Maharaj, the next question is, if wife does devotional service but husband doesn't? Hmm, same thing. Shall the husband be entitled to 50%? Yes, husband can get benefit from the wife. Okay. Women are at home. They have more time, the man's going out to work. So if the, if the woman's at home and doing devotion, and the husband's maintaining the wife, certainly he will get benefit. Because the husband, yes. husband's maintaining the wife. Is it necessarily 50% mad or is it something else? Well, <laughs> They share. They share each other's pious and sinful activities. I don't know how much they share, but they certainly, they, they both get benefit. They both, they help to benefit each other by their pious activities. That's a fact. Yes, Maharaj. Definitely may... out of the 50%, uh, the wife gets of the pious credits but I've not heard of that exact percentage the other way around. But uh, no, it makes sense that they share good Yeah, they enjoy each other's pious and sinful activities. So Prabhupada's making the point, the training in the beginning of life, very important, that if they're spiritually trained, then it, it makes it so much easier to enter into family life. And the proper training for the man is that he should be trained as brahmacharya, brahmachari, and the guru should be trained as in, to be chaste. You know, she shouldn't be running around with different men, different men every day and every week. She should be chaste. And then when time comes for her marriage, then she can be faithful to one man. And similarly with the man, he has to be brahmachari. He should be trained to meant to control his mind and senses. And then he can live peacefully with a wife. Now if he's not properly trained, if he, then it will be more difficult. <laughs> there was one uh, devotee long ago in the beginning of our movement, he wanted to get married, so he wrote to Prabhupada asking him, Prabhupada, I have the desire to enter into family life. So Prabhupada wrote back to him and said, okay, all right. He said, just wait. Just, and then he said, I will arrange and, and just be patient. So he wrote to Prabhupada again. He said, Prabhupada, I want to get married right away. <laughs> You know, he was really pushing Prabhupada. And so Prabhupada wrote back to him, he said, for the time being you forget about this. <laughs> you just forget about married life. <laughs> because he was pushing. He was so much anxious to get married, to enter into family life, that Prabhupada thought, this is not good. That you know, first of all, get control over your mind and senses, be peaceful, then one gradually we will arrange your marriage not immediately i thought it was quite an interesting 
situation. Okay, going ahead, uh, we hear about the advantages of living with a wife. This is in text number 18. As one can cross over the ocean with seagoing vessels, one can cross the dangerous situation of the material ocean by living with a wife. So that is uh, a glorification of the Grihastha Ashram. That certainly there's a lot of safety there in the Grihastha Ashram. You have the shelter of a wife. You don't have to go running around looking for, other, for a woman. You already have a wife at home. So it's, it makes a, a man actually feels peaceful when he's married and has a wife. He doesn't have to think about other women. Prabhu? Which text is that, Maharaj? This is text 18. Text 18 in the purport. I'm reading from the purport. The orders of brahmachari or pious student life, householder life with a wife, Retired life and renounced life all depend for successful advancement on the householder who lives with a wife. This competition is essential for the proper functioning of the institution of the four social orders and spiritual orders. A man who lives with a wife has a great responsibility and maintaining the members of the other spiritual orders. Except for the grihastas or the householders, everyone is supposed to engage in spiritual advancement of life. Therefore, brahmachari, vanaprastha and sannyasis have very little time to earn a livelihood. They therefore collect alms from the grihastas and thus they secure the bare necessities of life and cultivate spiritual understandings. So it's very nice to see how Prabhupada describes everything so exactly. You know, the, he's describing how the three ashrams, Brahmachari, Vanaprastas and Sannyasis, they depend on the Grihastas. And of course, not all Grihastas are in that position that they're able to give charity. But Prabhupada explains, it said, these three ashrams, they collect alms from the grihastas. But they should, Prabhupada then said, they secure the bare necessities of life and cultivate spiritual understanding. So this is the idea. You know, don't take more than what we need. Only take the bare necessities. So accepting from accepting charity, of course, we accept charity on behalf of the society, actually. Whatever is given to the sannyasis and like that, spiritual teachers, it's understood that it all belongs to ISKCON, that it's not the person's property, it's not his money, but it's for the society, for use in the development of the ISKCON society. Okay, the householder makes it. By helping the other three sections cultivate spiritual values, the householder also makes advancement in spiritual life. Yeah, when the householders give charity to the others, or when they give food, or whatever they give to the other ashram, by giving to the other ashrams, they're making advancement also. It's good for the householders to give. Ultimately, every member of society automatically becomes spiritually advanced and easily crosses the ocean of nations. When we cooperate together, there has to be that cooperation between the different ashrams, the sannyasis and brahmacharis, they should, they should collect the bare necessities. And then the householders, 
they should also be willing to support the other ashrams. Then text 19, we hear more glorification of the wife. Kajapa is really laying it on thick. Oh, respectful one, a wife is so helpful that she is called the better half of a man's body because of her sharing in all auspicious activities. So why is she the better half? Because she shares, right? She's sharing with him in the auspicious. A man can move without anxiety, entrusting all responsibilities to his wife. That's important. There's a saying, behind every great man, there's a greater woman. It's very important that you have the, the woman behind there who's supporting, who's taking care of everything, <laughs> at least in the material world, like that. Prabhupada explains the wife's the better half of a man because she's supposed to be responsible for discharging half of the duties of the husband. Someone asked me the other day, what about women in Varnashra? So they, women do Sri Dharma, they have to support their husbands. They do half of the duty of their husbands. A family man has a responsibility to perform five kinds of sacrifice, pancha yagya. And this way he gets relief from sin. And then But if, if he doesn't, if, if a man doesn't, if, if he accepts a wife, if a man accepts a wife just for sense gratification, if he thinks the wife is just there to satisfy his senses, then that is just animal life. That is the life of the cats and dogs. And Prabhupada says, when, when the wife is just for sense gratification, then the main consideration is personal beauty. And as soon as there's a break, and since there, then there's divorce. So it's important that the husband and wife think about spiritual advancement. And we have Prabhupada's own life as an example in that. You'll remember what happened when Prabhupada's father arranged the marriage for him. What did Prabhupada, did Prabhupada like his wife? No. No. And what did his father say? He said it is better, so he will not be too attached to her. Yes. Yes, if the wife is too beautiful, she's an enemy. The beautiful wife is an enemy for the husband. Of course, there is a different kind of beauty, and that is the beauty that if the wife can uh, actually uh, control her mind and senses, if she is a good, if she's a very caring wife, if she's very good in doing her responsibilities, keeping the house clean and cooking and, and not putting a lot of stress on the husband with a lot of material desires, demands, then that is much better. But even though Prabhupada, yes, even though Prabhupada didn't like his wife very much, he said initially he, did, he didn't like her very much, but still they had five children. Yes? The question is like, in ISKCON, we seem to have adapted the Grihastha Ashram, where we greatly encourage husband and wife to preach and reach out to others, spreading Krishna consciousness. Could you explain how this fits in? <clears throat> well, yes, if the husband and wife are equally spiritually advanced, and if the wife and husband have that mood of being preachers, then it's very good. 
Yeah, we do encourage husband and wife. If, 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 you know, because they were, if he was trained as a brahmachari before becoming a householder, maybe he's trained as a brahmachari, he's a, he, can know, he, know, he can preach, he knows the philosophy. And the girl is chaste, she should also be a devotee, maybe she also knows the philosophy, and certainly she can talk to other ladies. The point is that husband and wife are the best people to go preach because most people in the world are husband and wives. Most people in the material world out there are married. They're couples. And so if we have, de if we have devotee couples going preaching, then it's very easy for them to meet people and to talk to people and deal with them. Because they're married, they're a couple, and so they can meet other couples and relate to them very easily. But that's not so easy for a sannyasi. Sannyasis like that, brahmacharis, you know, they're different people. They may, they may come, they may give a class and so on, but it's difficult for them to make friendship with people who are not in their ashram, with householders and so on. But if somebody's, if you're in the householder ashram, and then it's much easier for you to go and meet other people, and you can bring people to your home as well, and you can make a, have a program, and they see your husband and wife, you live together, and like that. And so they come and they see how you can be Krishna conscious. It's a nice example for other people. The idea is to teach them by example. Srimad Bhagavatam speaks about ideal family life. And so we want to show that by our Krishna conscious grihastas, that they are ideal, ideal couples and they live ideal family life. They live together peacefully for spiritual advancement. So yeah, it's a great responsibility of householders. And we hope in more and more householders will take up this preaching work. Of course, they may say, well, it's very difficult, I have to maintain my family, I have to work or something, yeah. Yeah, everybody's doing that, everybody's working, everybody's maintaining their family, so many other... But at the same time, you have to also be Krishna conscious. So you have to, we want you to, to show that Krishna consciousness to others, be an example. So this is the idea of householder life, and certainly Prabhupada took advantage of householders to do that. He sent the householder couples to, to the West, uh, to London rather, from the USA. He sent the three householder couples there to, yeah, to the UK, and they did wonderful. They changed the world with their preaching. Now if he'd sent sannyasis, it wouldn't have been like that. If the sannyasis had gone to London, they would never have stayed there. When you read Shamsundar Prabhu's books about chase, chasing the rhinos with Swamiji, you can hear, you, you read what, he went, what they went through in London, very difficult. They had no money, and Prabhupada wasn't sending them any money. They were maintaining themselves. They, had, they struggled a lot. But because they were a household, they were householder couples, somehow they remained fixed, they remained steady, they stayed there, they didn't go away. I remember uh, Tejas, Tejas Prabhu, uh, senior Prabhupada disciple, he was the temple president of the center in Delhi, in New Delhi, in the capital of India. That was in 1975. And earlier, the, the Prabhupada had written to him, and Prabhupada had glorified him. He said, you stayed there in Delhi. He said, previously I sent sannyasis there, none of them would stay there. They would go there, they'd all give up. They say, Prabhupada, I can't stay here, this is terrible. You know, Delhi is <laughs> not an easy place to preach, especially for Americans coming to live there. You know, they don't speak English much there. It's a Hindi-speaking city, 
And uh, if you don't speak Hindi, then pretty difficult. But Teja stayed there, and Prabhupada really appreciated the fact that he stayed there. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also expected people to stay in their service, to remain fixed in their duties. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not pleased with Gadarhar when Gadarhar wanted to go with him to South India. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told him, you to stay in Puri, that you have your Gopinath there, you stay there and serve Gopinath and keep your, keep your vow of Kshetra Sanyas. So it's difficult for sannyasis to stay in one place. Sannyasis, they like to move, they like to travel, they don't want to get stuck in one place. But for householders, for couples, it's better that they're in one place. They don't want to be moving. They like to have a home, they like to have a greha, be steady there. But at the same time, they should also preach. Is that okay? Yes, thank you, Mark. Okay, so we're going ahead. We're up to text number 20 here. Hearing about the wife. We're still glorifying the wife. As a fort commander, very easily conquers invading plunderers by taking shelter of a wife. One can conquer the senses, which are unconquerable in the other spiritual orders. So this is praising the wife. You get, this is praising householder life. That you have a wife, you can take shelter of the wife. You, 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 you're troubled by your senses, but you have a wife, she can help you to control the senses. So it's important for a person to be properly situated. Prabhupada explains, the wife is supposed to be the commander of the fort and therefore whenever there is an attack on the body by the senses, it is the wife who protects the body from being smashed. The sex demand is inevitable for everyone, but for one who has a fixed wife, he is saved from the onslaught of the sense enemies. A man who possesses a good wife does not create a disturbance in society by corrupting virgin girls. Without a fixed wife, a man becomes a debauchee of the first order and is a nuisance in society unless he is a trained brahmachari, vanaprastha or sannyas. Unless there is rigid and systematic training of the brahmachari, by the expert spiritual teachers, and unless the student is obedient, it is sure that the so-called brahmachari will fall prey to the attack of sex. And then Prabhupada talks about Vishwamitra and how he can fall down. So then Grihastha is, the Grihastha is responsible for producing first quality brahmachari, vanaprastas and sannyas. <laughs> so this is all glorification of the wife. Text 21 continues, O oh, queen of the home. Oh, my goodness. You, you can see uh, uh, Kashyapa is really, really <laughs> under the spell of his wife. We are not able to act like you, nor could, nor could we repay you for what you have done even if we work for our entire life, or even after death. To repay you is not possible, even for those who are admirers of personal qualities. So, Prabhupada said this indicates that Kashyapa maybe have been, he was henpecked, or maybe he's talking in a joke. Not sure either what it is. but certainly excessive glorification of the wife. Prabhupada explains, not all husbands are as able to appreciate the good qualities of their wives. 
But even though one is able to appreciate these qualities, it is still not possible to repay the debt to the wife. So, that obligation, attachment to the wife, very important. We should have that appreciation, husband and wife. Kashyapa continues, text 22, Even though it is not possible to repay you, I shall satisfy your sex desire immediately for the sake of begetting children. But you must wait for only a few seconds so that others may not reproach me. This particular time is most inauspicious because at this time the horrible looking ghosts and constant companions of the Lord of the ghosts are visible. So we're hearing about Lord Shiva now. This is the section where Lord Shiva has been introduced. Lord Shiva, the king of the ghosts, Sitting on the back of the bull carrier travels at this time accompanied by ghosts who follow him for their welfare. So Lord Shiva, of course, he's the greatest Vaishnava. We celebrated Shivratri a little while, a few weeks ago. And so descriptions of Lord Shiva and his different qualities. Let's look more at the PowerPoint here. Okay, verses 30 to 31. We hear about Diti catching hold of her husband and Kashyapa being obliged to engage in sex, even though it was inauspicious. And then text 34 to 37, Diti implored her husband to help her in pacifying Lord Shiva, because Lord Shiva was present. So Kashyapa explained to Diti, Everything was inauspicious. This is text 38 to 43. Everything was inauspicious, and thus she would have two contemptuous sons who will kill poor, faultless living entities and torture women. Then the Lord will descend and kill them. However, there will be some benefit that because of Diti's lamentation, penitence, unflinching faith in the Lord, as well as her adoration for Lord Shiva and her husband, one of the sons, Prahlad, will be an approved devotee of the Lord. So this is the good news. And then finally, Kashyapa will describe some of the qualities of Prahlad. The main sections of the chapter. The wife is. Con yes, just a minute. Yes, go ahead. I have a question, Mara. Yes. Sivaji is said to be having high cases, high hairs. Yes, Panchamuki, yeah. So in each face, there are three eyes. Okay. So total, total 15 eyes. Five paces, three eyes, fifteen. Yes? So? I, I have doubt whether uh, on all the faces are having three eyes or only one face. I don't know. never heard about this. Okay. Usually we represent Lord Shiva. They just draw him with one face. But we do say Panchamukhi, Mahadevo, yes. Panchamukhi. Yes, brother. Yeah, just have five faces. Whether or not each one has three eyes, I'm not sure. Okay, All right. More about the wife. Text 17, purport, from Prabhupada's purport. For a conditioned soul, the wife is considered to be the source of liberation. She offers her husband service for ultimate liberation. Faithful wife is supposed to cooperate with her husband in fulfilling all material desires so that he can then become comfortable 
and execute spiritual activities for the perfection of life. <laughs> uh, I, this would be a bit difficult for you to do. Perform a role play showing how husband and wife should cooperate for spiritual advancement. I, I would like to hear from you, how would you imagine husband and wife should cooperate for spiritual advancement? We've read through these texts, 17 to 21, we've gone through them. So, how do you consider, what points do you think are important that how a husband and wife can cooperate for spiritual advancement? I think probably most of you are married, are you? And, yes, Maharaj. Yeah, right? And so you have experience in living with a, a partner. So, how do you cooperate for spiritual advancement? What do you think, what are some important points? Give us some, maybe one point, you could, each person come up with one point, what you think is very important. I can uh, start. Yes, Maraji. yes, Maharaji. So, um, to do all the activities, keeping Krishna in the center, like cooking for Krishna and uh, worshipping Krishna, uh, as a family, everyone can participate uh, doing their kirtan and reading together. Do you have kirtan in your home every day? Uh, not exactly, but we attend class uh, morning, afternoon, evening. Every day? Yes. Every day? Yes. So, uh, early morning, 6.30, actually, we attend uh, Bhagavatam class, 6.30, from 6.30 in the morning till 8 o'clock. And then in the evening we have Chaitanya Charitamrita and in the afternoon when I get time I read for my class. Or you read on your own in the afternoon? Yeah, it's in the afternoon in my, on my own. Yes. And, and, but you go together with your husband in the morning and evening? Yes, it's online. All online. Oh, it's all online. Okay. Yeah. Okay, which center is that? Um, from Philadelphia. We are in US, Philadelphia. Oh. Uh huh. So here we are attending early morning class uh, and we are doing uh, uh, the evening also uh, one Mataji is there she actually you know does the class for Chaitanya Charita Vrita so that also we are doing okay and now do you actually sit and listen when the class is going yes. on yes yes Maharaj. you don't do anything else you sit no. and listen Yes, but in the morning, uh, like kids are getting ready for school and all, so uh, we keep it on and we also, you know, like communicate with Mataji when she is taking the class and uh, we also continue doing our activities along with that because we have to get our kids ready and everything. Okay, yeah. So it's a kind of mix there, yeah. But in the evening you're sitting listening? Yes. And Saturday, Sunday also we have uh, different classes of, uh, after this class we have different classes of Chaitanya Charitamrita and Bhagavatam. All online? Yes, online. Luckily, because uh, some of them are from Atlanta and also different places, they're doing that. Oh, the classes are coming from Atlanta. Dif different parts, different cities are broadcasting, is it? Yes, so uh, we moved from Atlanta two years back, uh, uh, we were there in Atlanta, so uh, we still are in that group, so they're taking their classes, because of COVID most of them were online, but they are also doing in person nowadays, but uh, since we cannot be there, we are attending online. Okay, so husband and wife, you both listen to classes yes. every day yes yes and our kids and do, you, and do you ask do you ask questions yes yes i'm famous for asking questions here also <laughs> hmm? i'm famous for asking questions i ask a lot of questions oh good okay okay right let's hear from somebody else how do you cooperate for spiritual advancement Actually, uh, Maharaj, yes, I am good in the class. <coughs> yes? Uh, yeah. 
Actually, the previously uh, several leaves and conflicts uh, between both of us because we are not accepting Krishna consciousness, but by the efforts of uh, local devotees and uh, because of their interaction and their influences, she turned down. Now she's chanting, and uh, we uh, in the morning hours were chanting, sitting together, and uh, but she is not in a position uh, uh, to hear Bhagavatam and. Uh, other scriptures, but I am uh, I am motivating her to to adopt to accept uh, the hearing of Bhagavatam, etc. And uh, by the way, it is going in, but she is uh, she is cooking uh, prasadam for Lord, which is being offered to the Lord, and also she is taking care of the children. I have a daughter and a son; she is taking care of them. So I am also I am becoming comfortable in discharging my my professional responsibilities. And by the way, it is going on, and I'm seeking your mercy, Maharaj. How I will, I will, I will implore, I will develop myself in spiritual activities. Okay. He says, I have a position. Okay. So, your wife's a good support for your Krishna consciousness? Yes? Uh, yeah, she was not uh, supporting earlier. Now, she is chanting and uh, uh, I am proposing her to be initiated, but yet not uh, executed. And uh, yes, things are going on. So, uh, and the children are also taking interest. No, my son is chanting two rounds, but not sincerely doing because uh, there is uh, less impact from uh, from the side of the mother. And uh, despite I am I am endeavouring, it is uh, it is on the way. Okay, wish you good luck. Yes, you know, it's not very easy. You came to Krishna consciousness later, was it after marriage? Yeah, I accepted it after marriage. Uh -huh. Okay, so yeah, it takes some time to adjust, it's a change. But it's good your wife is gradually accepting. So we wish you good luck in that. Yeah, I'd like to hear somebody else. How how do you manage to cooperate? Yeah, Maharaj, uh, yes, it, uh, yes, uh, actually, because she's taking care of the children and their studies, etc., the school activities, she's monitoring and managing. Uh -huh. It's become easier for me in my life, so that uh, I'm not uh, disturbing her day-to-day uh, -day activities. Right. At least he is not chanting, and uh, I hope she will, uh, she will improve in uh, hearing and uh, reading Bhagavatam. Yeah, <laughs> we hope so. That's good. Anyway, she's she's cooperative. She's not objecting too much. All right, is somebody else there? We can hear one more. How do you cooperate with your wife, or how does the wife cooperate with the husband? Hare Krishna Maharaj, the Lord Pranam. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, <laughs> my wife is with me also in the same class. Together we are doing Bhakti Vaiva. Oh, okay, very nice. So, so we together did uh, Bhakti Sastri and also continuing Bhakti Vaiva. Oh, very nice, yes. Uh, and also, like, uh, Preaching uh, activities uh, uh, we share together, and uh, uh, so like uh, the same group that uh, Mataji is preaching, and I also involved in the preaching in the same group. Like Mataji is preaching Bhakti Visha, and the same people I am preaching, uh, taking Bhagavad class and uh, Bhagavad Gita study course. Very so nice. this is the way. Yes, good. You're both preaching. Very good. And Maharaj, we want uh, your blessing also. Uh, even though Mataji and we cooperate each other and uh, uh, and together, but uh, sometimes uh, we have some conflict with the, taking this uh, Krishna consciousness preaching activities. So how to, how to handle Maharaj? Well, I don't know. What's the problem? I will be different. <laughs> different. It depends on what the problem is. You know, preaching activities. So when Mataji, when Mataji involved in a lot of preaching activities, so there is a lack of concentration in household activities. That's why 
or uh, she is expecting something so which i cannot uh, i am i am doing something so always she uh, start uh, something uh, the you know abusing like that <laughs> well you both have to be tolerant that's the idea you know for the sake of krishna for krishna's service you don't have to have some tolerance you have to expect there will be some difficulties there will be sometimes some things which are not exactly the way you want not so ideal but you can't have everything you know <laughs> what yeah, what maharaj mata ji mata ji jo the and actually we, we have a son uh, is very good in uh, like kirtan and everything doing uh, chanting also and studying in gurukul bgis but uh, because of his uh, hyper uh, uh, active so sometimes they make the distraction knowingly like we are in class behind he he will purposefully do something to stop kind of noise <laughs> mm, yeah well, yeah you have to train him yeah he is actually very good in uh, like he is also sometimes taking class but uh, how to Uh, reduce his uh, raja guna <laughs> so or excite he is taking class also he can give some class also like that but uh, uh, he is uh, is uh, like it's very difficult to control because devotee children control devotee children because he has knowledge and how to train him we don't well you have to be a little again patient you know he's a young boy naturally you would expect healthy children to be like that gradually as he matures as he becomes older gradually that passion will be uh, reduced maharaj kindly bless us so that we can all together uh, progress in uh, good harmony oh yes may krishna bless you all make more spiritual advancement cooperate together that's the main thing and be tolerant and live together peacefully in the service of krishna and don't argue and quarrel with each other keep the home peaceful and, <laughs> and this way Krish you, krishna you, will bless you hari krishna Thank okay we're going ahead here's a Maharaj, from yes Maharaj, uh, please also bless us uh, and our family so we can be more krishna conscious and do the service more diligently Okay. Yes. yes, that's very nice. Be more Krishna conscious. We want that. That's a blessing we like to give. May your mind always be on Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. All right. Maharaj, I also like a blessing. <laughs> yes, I'm blessing all of you. That's our duty. <laughs> your duty also. You're all devotees. You all have to bless others. Not just me bless you. You have to bless others. Yeah, please bless us. My my wife is pregnant now. Our child can come any moment. Oh. And we try that it becomes he becomes a very nice uh, devotee, and uh, we are preaching. I have a YouTube channel. I'm preaching here in Germany, and she is helping me in this. We are maintaining ourselves by preaching online, and uh, have a nice online community. So, yeah, please bless us that our child will take on this uh, wonderful work. Oh wonderful very nice yes we wish you good luck may your wife has hope your wife will have a very nice safe delivery and your child will be a nice krishna conscious devotee i'm sure certainly very nice that the child and the woman is hearing spiritual sound vibrations all right so here's text 21 purport husbands as a class cannot repay their debt to women either in this life or in the next even if they engage themselves in repaying the woman throughout their whole lives it is still not possible oh so we the, the husband had such a great debt to the wife and the women are doing so much okay here's lord shiva text 24 Lord Shiva being very kind to the ghosts sees that although they are condemned they get physical bodies he places them into the wombs of women who indulge in sexual intercourse regardless of the restrictions on time and circumstances 
So this is one of Lord Shiva's services. He makes sure that even these ghosts get physical bodies, placing them into these kind of wombs. Another quality about Lord Shiva, he teaches the sincere devotees of the Lord how to practice detachment from material enjoyment. So that is very important. Another quality, he is very great and his renunciation of all material enjoyment is an ideal example of how one should be materially unattached. So this is all Lord Shiva's contribution, his example. We should be materially unattached. All right, and coming back after hearing about Lord Shiva, then we hear about Kashyapa explaining to his wife the, the results of her, the results of her uh, forcing herself onto her husband, that because of her polluted mind, because of the defilement of the time, and because of the negligence of my directions, and because of apathy to the demigods, nothing was auspicious. Everything was inauspicious, right? Polluted mind, lust, material desire, desire for sex, defilement of the time, it was the evening, just at dusk, negligence of my directions. Kashyapa told her, no, it's not very good, just wait. And then apathy to the demigods, even though he, she was warned that Lord Shiva's present. Demigods are witnesses. She did not care. She continued. So everything was inauspicious. However, on the other hand, because of Diti's lamentation after the incident, then she lamented her sin. And because of her penitence and deliberation, her unflinching faith in the Lord and her adoration of Lord Shiva and her, of her husband, then the result was one of the sons, Prahlad, one of the sons of your son, Haranyakashipu, will be an approved devotee of the Lord. So Haranyakashipu's son would be Prahlad and he would be a great devotee of the Lord. So, we ask you, what are some general principles relevant for Krishna conscious Grihastha life based on this incident between Diti and Kashyapa? This text 10 to 43. If any of you like to draw, you're welcome to draw. If you if you you're not an artist, then you may like to just simply speak and tell us something. What you feel are the relevant principles? What are the are the general principles relevant for Krishna conscious Grihastha life based on this incident between Diti and Kashyapa? What is the important things we need to remember? In Rush, can I say something? Yes. Yeah, the basic principle is that husband and wife understand that they are the soul and not the body, and that they use their ashram for serving Krishna, especially to um, make Krishna conscious children. To in and this is done by Garbhadam Samskara. That we understand what is Garbhadam Samskara. That we really understand how it works and uh, what it is and use garbage on some scar. Okay. So cert you certainly want to follow the regulated principle, which means making use of garbage on some scar. The idea of garbage on some scar is one will be meant both the husband and wife will be mentally purified as 
for the time of conceiving the child to attract, to attract a pure soul into the womb. Okay, any other principles which may be very helpful for Krishna conscious Grihastha life? In, in Krishna consciousness, my life, uh, the uh, unrestricted sex life should not be encouraged. That sex life should be utilized for the purpose of begetting a child of Krishna consciousness. And uh, most particularly in the special, in, in auspicious hours, we should abstain from being involved with uh, sense desires, which will protect the abominable consequence that had happened in the life of uh, Diti and Kasha. And uh, just life should be entirely dedicated to serving Krishna. And sense desires, sense motivations should be uh, by this, this, um, because of uh, effective endeavors. It should be reduced to minimum extent. And whenever we plan for getting a child, we must seek the permission of a uh, of a bona fide spiritual master under whose guidance we, are, we, are, we have been initiated. That is the, that, that most of the principles are in my understanding. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, Prabhupada does mention we shouldn't, we shouldn't hide, we shouldn't like uh, keep it secret that we want to have a child. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of or anything. It's, you know, it's duty of the householders. They want, they would like to have a child and they can get permission, seek the blessings of the spiritual teacher and he will of course guide them and tell them, you know, garb, do Garbhadana Samskar, do it properly. I remember His Holiness Jai Pataka Swami talking about this to all of his devotees in the Middle East and he told them that this is your duty you want to have children, you perform Garbhadan Samskar and you get a good child. So that's one part of Grihastha life, but there are other principles. <laughs> Helping each other to serve Krishna and to for the spiritual life so they can ultimately go back to Godhead together. What about this situation between Diti and Kashyapa that, you know, here is poor Diti, you know, she's in this situation, she doesn't have a child. And the other sisters all have a child. So naturally, she will be thinking about having a child. She's in that situation. And, and here is Kashyap, and he's the husband, and he's come home. Now, you know, it's an inauspicious time. Does it mean the husband shouldn't come, he shouldn't be around the house at the inauspicious time? You know, at the time of dusk, better the husband's not there, is it? It's not like that, Maharaj. What is it, what is it like then? So, uh, like Maharaj, in, in the evening time, like uh, one, one should be preparing for this Mangala, uh, sorry, the Gora Arati or uh, evening Arati. So that should not be in a avoided like husband should not be at house. So there was some some kind of devotional activities. So Maharaj, I understand that from here at this point. If husband is ideal, so wife should respect. If husband is what? Ideal. Ideal. Uh-huh. If well so Kashyap wasn't was he not an ideal husband? He was ideal. But Diti didn't listen. She so didn't listen. Uh, he was ideal, but she didn't listen. Yeah, so, uh, Maharaj, I, I, the point I want to say, uh, when husband is ideal, so uh, husband's advice, wife should listen. But, so but there's Kashyap. Kashyap was an ideal husband, but the wife didn't listen. Yes. The same thing I want to, I want to, I'm highlighting. If uh, in Krishna conscious Grihastha life, if husband is ideal, so wife should listen. But wasn't Kashyapa and the Diti, were they not ideal? Because Kashyapa advised not to have this, uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, sense gratification at this time, but Diti didn't listen. Yeah, she didn't listen. 
yeah the, the general principle is that what i am to say and i want to say that if husband is ideal and his suggestion wife should listen yeah no, i'm just trying to understand your argument because i would i would consider you know kashyap in, in many ways he was ideal husband you know he wasn't doing gorarti but he was you know he, he he did his sacrifice he just finished offering oblations into the sacred fire you know he was doing his duty as a krishna conscious as a as a grihastha according to the varnashram he was a brahmana and he was doing everything he should do but then the, the, the DT is overwhelmed by sex desire. Yeah, because the, if Diti could, the Diti could have listened to ideal husband, advice, so this is not the right time or anything, so then this situation could not arrive. Maj, it almost feels like, uh, obviously we don't have the prehistory, but it almost seems like perhaps some communication between the husband and the wife would have perhaps helped like beforehand because if Kasyapa knows that the other sisters all have sons and um, Diti doesn't then naturally um, yeah there was some cause of concern there so he could have you know like some planning communication could have perhaps helped the situation obviously we don't know exactly what happened but I don't know that's what I was thinking uh -huh. that, um, just just yeah as you said it's his duty to treat each of his wives fairly, right? Yeah. And naturally, he's just asking for a fair share. So I feel that, um, yeah, if he had been, I don't know, a little bit more on top of it or communicated it perhaps a bit better or, you know, just said, okay, we're going to have a child, maybe not now, but, you know, at least set that expectation, have that conversation rather than it being so abrupt, you know, as... Uh, is the case in this scenario. I don't, these are just my thoughts, just on what we were just discussing. Yes, I think so. I think that, that you know, that we could, it's not all just Diti's fault that Kashyapa, as a husband, he should have been thinking also about his wife, that she doesn't have a child, the other, other wife, my other wife, all have children, and Diti doesn't have a child. There should have been some communication there. He should have been telling her we have to plan to have a child. You know, he should have been, he should be, he should be thinking about his wife's situation. Maybe this situation would not have arised <laughs> if this was communicated before, or maybe he uh, could have uh, given her a child before itself, right? Maybe. Obviously, there's a purpose behind which Bhagavatam is being told, but we're just saying, like, yeah, like ideally. Especially if you've got multiple wives, right? Like, you have to treat them fairly. Um, but yeah, nowadays even just keeping one is tough. <laughs> yeah, you just have one wife, yeah, but you have one wife, and if all the, other, all the other ladies have a child and your wife doesn't have a child, then that will be a problem. And you, you have to expect your wife wants a child. That there's, you know, there'll be pressure from the other girls, the other ladies, they'll say, you don't have a child yet? We, you know, we, are all, we all have a child, you don't have a child yet. And, you know, that kind of talk goes on between ladies. And then, the, and then the, the, the girl who doesn't have a child, she'll naturally feel bad and she wants a child. Yes, Maharaj, even if they have one child, and if everyone has two child, that could still happen. So yes, agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, organization, um, yeah, is definitely key in a relationship, especially girls to so general principles relevant for Krishna conscious Grihastha life. Uh, we have to appreciate, try to put ourselves in the other's position. Don't just think about what we want, you know. The hus if the husband gets so wrapped up in his own thing and forgets about his wife, what his wife wants, then that's not good. And similarly, the wife also has to be conscious of the husband. There has to be that some give and take on both sides, the cooperation to understand the, the needs and demands. Of course, some husbands, they're very happy to have children and other husbands, sometimes they don't want children, not so eager. 
but family life generally there should be a child family life is without a child, then it said family life is like the desert without having a child. So it's an important part of the family life. Okay, let's go ahead here. The unique... So Maharaj, Maharaj, yeah, uh, yes. Herself, herself, uh, because of his less spiritual potency, as he was not devotee of uh, Lord, he was devotee of Shivji, he was a devotee of Lord Shiva. And uh, because of a lack of spiritual potency, it, it would have been avoided in the sinful situation. But because of his reluctance, his, his passiveness, he didn't um, uh, protect a wife uh, who had been afflicted by the sex, sensual desire, who had been afflicted by the uh, sexual motivation. Was it not the fault on part of Pasha? Yes, definitely there's a fault, there's faults on his part also, yes. <sighs> yeah, we agree. And, you know, Prabhupada also writes in the purport, he talks about how Kashyapa was talking to his wife, how he's praising her and he's praising the role of women and everything. He was really flattering her and glorifying women, you know, we cannot repay you for so many lifetimes and this and that. And the, the wife is a better half of the husband and so many things. And so he was really, really encouraging his wife, you could say. He didn't, he didn't really rebuke her, although she was expressing her, her fault, she understood that, you know, She's lusty and she, she just has this desire. But he, he didn't deal with her in a, in a, in a very, in, in the, the effective manner which was really needed. And Prabhupada mentions he, he could have spoken strongly to her. He could have spoken more harshly to her, but he didn't do that. Instead he was, you know, Oh, my dear wife, oh, my, like this, you know, he was very sweet and gentle. And so he's like encouraging her almost. So, sometimes Prabhupada would explain a householder life that they, the husband and wife should help each other to control the senses. Sometimes the wife will be overwhelmed by lust, and sometimes the husband is the one who is affected by lust. And so then it's the duty of the other party to help their partner to control their mind and senses and to come to a Krishna conscious standard of life. To be faithful and chaste, to follow the rules and regulations. And certainly, sometimes it ne that men can be more, more as, just, as, just as lusty as women. And the men are overwhelmed with sex desire and they want to enjoy the wife. And so then the wife has to rebuke the husband. And, and women can do that. They're, they have the sharp tongue, <laughs> which can help to put the man in his place. So, Krishna conscious grihasta life, yet yeah, we have, uh, it, it should be, Prabhupada explains if the husband and wife can live together without quarreling, then they will always have the blessings of the goddess of fortune. So that's very important in family life. You definitely want to have the blessings of the goddess of fortune. So to get that blessing, you have to live together peacefully, without arguing. Now, now is Kali Yuga, however, it's very easy for us to argue, and especially husband and wife living together. You're familiar, you become familiar with each other, and we can become critical and argue. And so, even Lord Krishna used to enjoy joking words with his wives. Rukmini and Satyabhama, sometimes, you know, Satyabhama is very proud and sometimes she's greedy, she wants things. 
so the idea is tolerance and at the same time understanding each other's mind and be willing to help each other to control the mind and senses. There should be some agreement between the husband and wife that they want to help each other in their Krishna consciousness. His, Holy, His Holiness Jaipataka Swami uh, prepared a questionnaire. I think there's about a hundred questions for husband and wife to go through before married life. And it's an ideal preparation for married life. If they go through these 100, 100 questions with each other, then they'll get to know each other quite well and they'll understand what each other, what's in, what, where each other is at, what is in their mind, what their desires are like, what kind of thoughts they have, what kind of ambitions they have. Because oftentimes we find husband and wife get married without really knowing each other and without being too much aware of each other's needs and demands. So it's certainly a good idea. You go through this questionnaire which he has, then it, it helps to make your, your understanding of each other much better and you're prepared for Grihastha life. Marge, one devotee has a question. Uh, they're just traveling by train, so they can't ask it. So I'm just asking on their behalf. Okay. Um, Marge, from this episode of Kashyapa and Diti, we can see that the rules of Garbadam Sanskar were smashed because of weakness of both of them. So how in our lives can we restrain our senses from getting a good child, seeing that exalted personalities themselves could not restrain themselves. Yes. <laughs> well, how this is what what this is the what we're trying to understand from this chapter. This is actually the what we're asking here. What are the general principles relevant for Krishna conscious Grihastha life? What do we need to apply as Krishna conscious devotees in, in Grihastha life? So I'm trying, we're trying, I'm trying to give you some guidelines which will help us to, uh, to apply in our Krishna conscious Grihastha life. I think it's important that each, the man, husband and wife, they have to understand each other and not just be thinking only of their own self. And that's why I suggested that if you go through this, this question and answer thing which they have, then it's a very good help for people to know each other and to be prepared for living with each other in Grihastha Ashram. You, you definitely want to be aware of the needs and the demands. What, what, does, it, what does the wife expect from the husband? You know, you're going to get married, you're going... Does she expect a child immediately? How many children does she expect? <laughs> you know, these are things which sometimes they, you need to discuss before, you, before entering into family life. And as, is a husband, uh, is he able to support the family all right? Are you properly situated economically to maintain a family life? That's also important. We have to, sometimes it may require minimizing our own demands, you know, cutting down our own expenses in order to maintain a family. And sometimes a husband has to work harder earn more. <laughs> but those are things which really you want to avoid. You don't want to be put in the position that the husband has to sacrifice Krishna consciousness just to earn more money, just to satisfy the wife. That's not very good. If the husband has to make so much effort to get more money just to please his wife, 
and he loses his Krishna consciousness, then that's not good. And so Diti and Kashyapa, they, they had a problem, but remember Kashyapa had, he had a lot of wives, 13 wives. So you could imagine that he's, you know, and, he, and they all had children, all 12 wives had children, she's the only one without children. So he's quite, you know, he, he, he's maybe also, but at the same time, he's also pointing out to his wife the importance of the regulations, he, he was aware of what was happening, but he gave in to his wife. So his weakness was there. We could say that he was not properly trained as a brahmachari. Maybe he didn't go through the brahmachari training. But certainly he was a very powerful husband. All 13 girls wanted to marry him. They chose him as their husband. So he, he definitely had some good qualities. I don't think all the 13 girls picked their husband just on the, the husband's looks. Why would they pick Kashyapa as their husband? What was the motivating force? Well, he's a, he's a, he was a very senior person in the universe, very respectable. The son of Marichi is very well known. And so and he appeared to be a suitable husband. But still, it was arranged by the will of Providence. They fell down. They entered, they did something which was not according to religious principles. And the result was, we got birth of the two demons, right? So relevant principles for Krishna conscious Grihastha life. Certainly, it's important. We, we make vows for regulative principles. So they ha we have to be very strong in Krishna consciousness. The force of material nature, Prabhupada said, everyone's affected by sex desire. It's natural. So you have to take care to avoid it at, at these inauspicious times. Definitely, we don't want to be overwhelmed. <coughs> the main point is we want good quality children. You want good quality children. That's the main thing. We should have that desire. That therefore, we must do it the proper way. That's important. Okay, going ahead. Here's Lord Chaitanya. Maharaj, one, one, uh, one point, but at least one thing was good that because of all these things, uh, Prahlad Maharaj was born in her family and they will all be liberated because of the pure devotee. So that is one good thing. Although I'm not saying that's why we have to, you know, uh, desire for demon sons, but I'm saying because they have, gosh, because it is arranged by Krishna, they, she is actually getting a grandson who is a pure devotee of Krishna. Yes. Yes. So that was because of her good qualities, because there were some good things in her, her penitence. And, repentance and her faith in her husband and like that. Okay, so what about this, uh, the contribution of Lord Chaitanya to human society? During the age of Kali, there is no discipline 
in sex life. How then can one expect good children? Certainly, unwanted children cannot be a source of happiness in society. But through the Krishna consciousness movement, they can be raised to the human standard by chanting the holy name of God. That is the unique contribution of Lord Chaitanya to human society. So, of course, Prabhupada gave us the Garbhadan Samskar. The Garbhadan Samskar, we're not practicing just some ritualistic ceremony, but the, the, the real Garbhadan Samskar is the chanting of the holy names. And Prabhupada prescribed that we should chant 50 rounds before attempting to conceive a child. And here, Prabhupada's mentioning, unwanted children are not a source of happiness, but through the Krishna consciousness movement, they can be raised to the human standard. Remember, we were seeing Lord Shiva places these ghosts in the womb of people who don't follow the religious principles. So you get these uh, unwanted children, but they can be raised to the human standard by chanting Hare Krishna. And this is the special contribution of Lord Chaitanya to the human society. So, Kali Yuga, everyone's a fallen soul. We need to get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, chanting the holy name. So, Krishna consciousness has helped so many of us to come to the human standard. Although, in the beginning, certainly, who is, whose, life was, uh, whose life was not uh, irreligious? Practically in the Kali Yuga, everyone's born in irreligious circumstances. Even the Brahmanas, the Brahmanas are not Brahmanas by birth because the Brahmanas themselves don't follow any religious principles. Many of them not, are not even aware of the religious principles. So we're trying to educate people about these things. And Prabhupada said one time, he said it would take three generations before we may get good progeny. He said it would take some time. In the beginning, it will be difficult. We're coming out of the material world into the highest level of spiritual life, it's difficult to practice Krishna consciousness. Even Kashyapa and Diti, of course, they they were not Krishna conscious, but still they did have a very good child. They could produce Prahlad Maharaj. Okay, let's look what we covered. The incident between Diti and Kashyap. The overview of the incident. What was the main points about the incident? Diti is approaching Kashyap. Why? Someone? The, what? Because she was overwhelmed for uh, sex desire. Yes, and at what time did she approach him? In the inauspicious time in the evening. Right. Why was that inauspicious? Because that, that, that time Lord Shiva and all the ghosts, they uh, travel the universe. Right. So it was certainly inauspicious time. Okay. And then? Lord Shiva is an ideal example for devotional life. Yes, that's in text 29. Lord Shiva is materially detached, which are appropriate for devotional life. 
is materially detached. Well, that may not be so appropriate for devotional life, just to be materially detached. Do you really think that's good? You know, to, be mater to be materially detached is not so much essential. If you're too much detached, it's not good for devotional life. He's continuously meditating on Krishna. Oh, yes, well, yes. He, is, is he meditating on Krishna? Who is he meditating on? Who does Lord Shiva meditate on? Vishnu. Who? Vishnu, right? Krishna. Sankarshan. Sankarshan. Usually, Sankarshan. But we do say he's a Vaishnava. He's a Vaishnavam Yata Shambhu. So, yes, Sankarshan. Just to read. But, but, but Maharaj, uh, detachment and knowledge are two essential components for progressing in uh, Krishna consciousness. Yes, but if it's detachment alone without devotion, it's not good. Right? If you have this detachment without devotion to Krishna, then that can be Falgo Vairagya. So the detachment has to be proper. If one is too much detached, the heart will become hard. And we don't want a hard heart, we want the soft heart. But Maharaj, our detachment is dovetailing all our, all our <coughs> possessions, all our activity in the service of Lord Krishna. Well, yes, if you're doing, if, if that's what you mean by detachment, if you mean to use everything in the service of Krishna, then that's all right. But if you just want to be detached and just to give up everything, that's not good. But if you connect, your, your, if your renunciation is in relation to Krishna, it should be yukta vairagya, right? It must be yukta vairagya. It must be in relation to Krishna, in relation to devotional service. Otherwise, that renunciation will be false renunciation. Now, if we think, I want to be like Lord Shiva, I'll go naked. I'll be a wild man. I'll ride, ride a bull. Is that a good example for devotional life? So, no. so, so Maharaj, my, my, my question, uh, still there is a doubt that uh, Shivji, Lord Shiva was, uh, uh, was in the mode of that detachment or he was, what he was engaging in the service of Lord Krishna, but externally it is, it is seen that he had detached everything and uh, he was not wearing properly, he was, uh, was uh, what, wrapping snakes uh, on his neck, etc., showing the very, very, uh, what, symbolic representation of highest degree of detachment. Well, the snakes on his body, they represent Sankarshan. He meditates on Lord Sankarshan. That's how it's described in Bhagavatam, that these snakes on the body of Lord Shiva are representations of Sankarshan. So one has to understand everything in the proper way. No, Lord Shiva, yeah, he, he appears to be very detached, but at the same time he has his wife. You know, he has a wife. So you could say he's not, not so yeah, detached. Yeah. But Maharaj, he was in mode of Yukta Varag or Phantu Varag? Lord Shiva is Yukta Varag, yeah? But you have, I want to hear from you. <coughs> How and what way is he an example? <coughs> uh, sorry, excuse me. In what way is Lord Shiva an example of devotional life? You're going to. <coughs> are you going to put snakes on your body? 
numerous. No, it's not possible. No, right. So, in what way? In what? But what are the examples? How Lord Shiva is an ideal example. But he has uh, he has uh, no much uh, attachment towards enjoyment, etc. And he was living a very simple life. Simple living and high thinking was the was the basic point in his uh, in his devotional practices. And uh, he was uh, every time he was uh, meditating upon the upon Lord Krishna. Okay. Can I say one point? Yes. Uh, so he uh, he had uh, material energy under his control. Parvati is actually material energy and which is under his control. But he did not. He could have uh, you know exploited that and enjoyed his life. But he lived a life of renounced order, and uh, but continued the service of Krishna diligently. And uh, that is how we can see uh, Lord Shiva and that's how we can follow. Not follow his attire or that he's living in crematorium or showing renouncement, which is, which is not encouraged because he is a high personality. We cannot imitate him, but we can follow his footsteps. Uh, he had taken poison in his, when the churning of the ocean was going on. So we cannot follow the exactly like that, but yeah. we can follow those things which he has shown that this is how we have to lead our life. Okay, but why why is he in the crematorium? What's he doing there? Why does he why does he place these souls? You know, because, the ghosts. Oh, because he is in uh, ignorance. He is the controller of mode of ignorance. And uh, the ghosts, they are uh, like the, the ghosts are like who committed suicide or you know, untimely death. So, those souls or the sinful souls who are there, he takes um, control of them, he takes care of them uh, to bring them to the path of Krishna consciousness. They, he guides them. So, that is why he is always in the crematorium and he is covered in the ashes. Well, we, we don't um, actually hear that he brings them to Krishna consciousness. What we did hear was that he takes the ghosts and he puts, he gets them a human body. Yes, so he, they can. Uh, so, that's his compassion, body. his compassion on the fallen souls. Okay. He's very compassionate on the fallen souls. That's a Vaishnava. Right, that he del he brought them to a he got them the physical body, and of course you could say well at least in the physical body they have a chance for Krishna consciousness, not that they will immediately become devotees, because you know they were, they were ghosts they're coming from the ghostly body, and then he puts them in the womb of people who have sex at irreligious times, so it's not a very auspicious birth. But at least they get a physical body. So that's his compassion. That's the example which is given. And his, his uh, devilish characteristics is described in text 29 that these are simply imitation. That he simply imitates like that. Uh, Prabhupada writes the purport here of text 29 that uh, he's the incarnation of the mode of ignorance and one of the three deities representing the Supreme Lord. As his representative, Lord Shiva is identical with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's very great and his renunciation of material enjoyment is an ideal example of how one should be materially unattached. One should therefore follow in his footsteps and be unattached to matter, not imitate his uncommon acts like drinking poison. Uh, so we should be unattached to matter. Uh, but, you know, of course, we're not going to be, be able to be like Lord Shiva, you know, to, to go naked and like things like that, snakes on the body, cover the body with ashes. 
But the example of detachment from sense gratification, that's important. And compassion on the fallen souls, compassion on those ghosts, placing them in bodies, that, that's important. All right, and then the, the qualities and behavior of Prahlad in relation to our personal application. The qualities and behavior of Prahlad described in text 46 up to 50, right? We can have a look at that, text 46 up to 50. Let's see here. Something about the quality. In order to... It said, in order to follow in his footsteps, saintly persons will try to emulate his character by practicing freedom from animosity, just as the purifying process rectify gold of inferior quality. So this is Prahlad Maharaj. Everyone will be pleased with him because the personality of Godhead, the supreme controller of the universe, is always satisfied with a devotee who does not wish for anything beyond him. So this is a nice quality for a devotee. Everyone will be pleased with him. Just like the Goswamis of Vrindavan, dira dira jana priyo priyakaro. They, they were loved by the gentle and by the ruffians because they were very dear to Krishna. So therefore everyone loved him. And that's the same with Prahlad Maharaj. That topmost devotee of the Lord, text number 48, will have expanded intelligence and expanded influence and will be the greatest of the great souls. Due to material or due to mature devotional service, he will certainly be situated in transcendental ecstasy and will enter the spiritual sky after quitting this material world. So he, he's really a great devotee. He will be virtuously qualified, rel reservoir of all good qualities. He will be jolly and happy in others' happiness, distressed in others' distress, and will have no enemies. He will be a destroyer of the lamentation of all the universes, like the pleasant moon after the summer sun. So these very nice examples here, how he, he will be happy to, when others are happy. Our tendency is when we see others happy, we're, we're, we're jealous, we don't like it. And, but Prahlad, he, when he sees others in distress, he will also feel distressed. When we see someone in distress, we like it. But Prahlad, he would feel distressed. So it shows the mood of the pure devotee. And then text 50, your grandson will be able to see inside and outside the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whose wife is the beautiful Goddess of Fortune. The Lord can assume the form desired by the devotee, and his face is always beautifully decorated with earrings. So this is the qualities of the Uttama Adhikari, seen in Prahlad Maharaj. Preaching application. We gave examples how husband and wife could cooperate for spiritual advancement. And then the role of, the role of Lord Shiva, the role of Lord Shiva, we spoke about placing the child in the womb. The incident between Diti and Kashyapa teaches us about Krishna conscious Grihastha life. Prabhupada would say, it's like going to a feast and fasting, <laughs> right? That was one example Prabhupada gave about Krishna conscious householder life. You go to a feast, you fast. Positive and negative aspects of Diti's actions and disgust their result. So that was given to us by Kashyapa, the positive and negative aspects. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any questions, comments on this? Uh, my mother said uh, 
Priya? Uh, devotees going to office uh, with fasting, what does it mean? Hmm. <laughs> Prabhupada said, married life is like going to a feast and fasting. Because in Prabhupada said, householder life, the opportunity is there for sense gratification any time. So you have to control your senses. Just like you go to a feast, there's a lot of prasadam on the table, but you're not going to eat. You may be fasting. And so family life is a bit like that, householder life. Sense gratification is there. You could eat a lot, you have your fridge, you have food there in the fridge, you can go and eat something. You can do a lot of things, family life. You have your own home, maybe you watch television, watch movies and things like that. Nobody's there to check on you what time you wake up in the morning. You're a grihasta, you know, you wake up late in the morning, you don't care about, I'm a grihasta. I, you, so, you have to be strict in family life. We make, some people think it's just an opportunity to do what you want, be, to have sense gratification. But Prabhupada said, no, it's like going to the feast, but fasting. You have to control. And Prabhupada also described householder life. He said, when they cook food, they should call out, food is prepared in our home. Anybody is hungry, come and eat. Anybody is hungry, come and eat. They should call out and invite people to come and eat. It is better to be in Brahmachari life. <laughs> But then our ladies won't have any husbands. That's not good. <gasps> all the ladies have to get married. Yes, the men should be all brahmachari and the ladies should all get married. Right? Maharaj, I have listened to one lecture from Prabhupada where he was saying that uh, ladies should be um, serving their husband so when they die, they, they will be naturally having a, uh, attachment to their husband and when they die, they will be thinking of their husband and in the next birth, they will take birth as a man. Then they will do pure devotional service and go back to Godhead. So we are anyway in miserable uh, situation. We can't go back to Godhead in our uh, uh, woman body. That's what it's saying. No, women can also go back to Godhead. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Sriyo Vaishya Sudras Tepi Yanti Parangatim. Even though we have lower birth, we can attain the supreme destination. So women can go back to God. But not depending on husbands, right? I mean, there are some uh, family where women are much more higher in practicing Krishna consciousness than men. So, if she is thinking about men, about her husband during uh, her, you know, death time, I hope she will not fall down instead of going up. Hmm. Yes, it's not the same for everyone. Sometimes husband will help the wife. Sometimes maybe a bur a burden. Anyway, it's up to Krishna. Krishna knows the heart. In the heart you have to be attached to Krishna and you have to see your husband, the Krishna is in your husband's heart as well. And by the arrangement of Krishna somehow you have a husband, so you have to be a faithful wife to him. Do your duty and at the same time take shelter of Krishna. Yes, but you can go back to Godhead, don't doubt, you can go back in this life. 
shelter. Just take shelter of Krishna and serve your husband nicely, be faithful, be chaste, and Krishna will bring you back home, back to Godhead. Okay, any other questions, comments? Okay, then we'll finish then. So we'll see you tomorrow night. We'll go on to chapter 15, is it? Yeah. Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Go back to Vrinda ki jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.